Welcome to Wednesday's workshop by APCUG, where we get together midweek, where someone is going to explain technology for our understanding. Our theme is Tis the Season for Taking Pictures and Videos. And our presenter is someone who has been with us quite a lot, sharing his knowledge, and he seems to always have more. We're going to be talking with John Kraut today, and as we say, he's the other John K. And John's going to be sharing his knowledge about recording 4K resolution videos with your smartphone. John, over to you. All right, thank you for that introduction. I am uh, about to share my screen, folks. The first thing, well, I, there's a couple of things I wanted to say first, now that I think about it. I have sitting here at my desk a Canon CanoScan 9000F Mark II flatbed scanner. It does a terrific job of scanning slides. I have, from my film days, 29 years of uh, shooting Ektachrome, I have approximately 13,000 Ektachrome slides, and I use that to scan the slides. I don't think of it as a high volume scanner. Uh, there's one that Nikon made that would allow you to put in a tray 50 slides and it would scan all 50. And that'll, and then you could repeat that process. You can see, even for me, it would take a long time to use that one. And I've been very selective about what I scan with mine because I only can scan a few at a time. Um, Let's see here, what else? Oh, uh, I wanted to mention this picture behind me is something I shot in Richmond, Virginia several years ago at this time of year. Two families next door and, and it turns out in the larger house, the son has raised his family, his parents live in the smaller house next door and they've been addicted to this sort of, uh, uh, how, how can I put it gently, um, hyperactive decorating scheme. Um, it's a six second photograph and the, the lights you see in the bottom, the long streaks, horizontal streaks, are cars passing by. Um, I have to thank my daughter for that. She was living full time in Richmond at the time and she found out about this place and said, dad, you've got to come here. And she was right. All right, now I'm gonna share my uh, slide deck. And the first slide you're gonna see is, is dark. Don't worry about it. It is not a failure on your si side. Oh, one other thing. I think for me personally, this sets a record because our, our uh, uh, audience member from uh, the uh, Melbourne area is, is here. And that means I'm broadcasting almost directly across the world from where I live in Arlington, Virginia. I just want to say, good day, mate. To record 4K resolution video with a smartphone. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what does that word 4K mean? Um, let's start with full high definition. This is what's called the US and now uh, in most countries of the world uh, standard there as well for television broadcasting. And that uh, full high def res resolution is 1920 pixels wide and 1080 pixels high and you multiply those two together, it's about 2.1 megapixels. Uh, it is the US standard, uh, was uh, adopted uh, about 20 years ago and has been adopted by many other countries simply because uh, once the US does something and uh, the price of participation, such as the cost of a television comes down, uh, other countries find it's very easy to get involved in that economy of scale. Now 4K by comparison doubles both the horizontal pixel measurement and the vertical pixel measurement. And how does that work out? Well, it turns out 3,840 wide by 2,160 high, and that's about 8.3 megapixels per frame which is, and why is greater resolution of interest to us? Why is it useful? And the answer is very simple. Human eyes love detail. There's more detail in a 4K video image than there is in a full high def uh, video image. So 
Now, here's a, a quick summary of what else we're going to talk about. Uh, 4K high def TV sets and 4K media. If you have a TV set, you have to know what media is available to make use of that TV set. 4K video cameras, that's the bad news in this area, by the way. And then 4K recording apps for Android and Apple iOS devices. And it turns out some of the most recent ones, the default camera app can be configured to shoot 4K video. But in the older ones, such as my Galaxy S10, which was designed, I think, about eight years ago, um, it also can do that by adding a free app. And the same thing is true for older iOS devices. You can add an app to shoot 4K video. Uh, I'm gonna show you a 4K uh, uh, free 4K video editor, which comes from down under as it happens. Um, and we'll learn how to display a 4K video shot by your phone on an LG 4K smart TV. All right, now, we mentioned full high def. Uh, full high def not only involves the uh, resolution that we mentioned, but also 30 frames per second is the standard frame rate. Many small inexpensive high def TVs provide less than full high def re uh, resolution. It's 1280 by 720. And those things typically run, oh, 80 or 100, 120 bucks, something like that. Uh, just in case you didn't know, HD TVs are all computers running the Linux operating system. And they also, because of that, they're very flexible. They can support other frame rates, lower frame rates, such as 15 or 25 per second, and a higher frame rate, such as 60. I've even seen some that'll support 120 frames per second. Um, and I'm sure many of you remember the bad old days, the digital transmission standard was adopted to replace the decades old US analog TV standard known back then as the National Television Standards Committee or NTSC. And some people made fun of that by calling it never twice the same color. Same acronym, different meaning. Um, now why is 4K useful today? It's not obviously not being broadcast, but it's already in widespread use in other ways. 4K TVs and 4K Blu-ray players are inexpensive already. They weren't when I started looking into it, but they are now. Your grandchildren will grow up with 4K video because of streaming and will learn to expect it. You can make 4K videos of your grandchildren and yourself inexpensively already using your smartphone or tablet. We'll find out how to do that. You can edit 4K video using a free video editor software package. I'm gonna give you the link for that. You can show your 4K videos on a 4K TV very easily. Learn how to do that too. Now, 4K started out in movie theaters. The first 4K digital movie I saw in a movie theater was the Star Trek Into Darkness movie in May of 2013. And I was in the front row and that was a mistake and I'll tell you why. I relearned a lesson that night, a screen can be too wide. Spread 3,840 pixels across a 20 foot, a 20 foot wide screen and sit up close and you can see every pixel. It was about 198 per, per horizontal foot on that screen. And that meant per inch, it was only about 16.5. Now, 4K resolution TVs have an interesting history in the US. They became available in the US the year before I saw that movie and the price per, uh, HD TV at that resolution was about $20,000. So it wasn't a big audience for that kind of price. But five years later, I bought a 42 inch LG HD TV at the end of 2017 for $300.
That screen measures just over 36 inches horizontal. And that meant it was about 100 pixels per inch or 1200, just over 1200 per foot. And I got to tell you, video looks great. 4K video looks terrific on that TV. I sit about 10 feet away from it. And even high resolution digital photos look terrific on that TV. I consider it the world's highest resolution digital photo frame. And as it happens, every December, 4K TV sets are deeply discounted. There are a number currently available from the major retailers at less than $300. I even found one this weekend at, advertised at Best Buy for $179. Now let's talk about the media. This is what we call a chicken or the egg situation. You don't buy the TV set and let them, unless the media is available. You don't buy the media unless there's a TV set available. And in the media industry, that's been a recognized issue for a long time. Any new media player won't sell until the media is available to play. And that includes both the TV set and whatever is used to deliver the media to the TV set. So 4K Blu-ray players, they're widely available now for as little as $100. In 2017, when I bought my TV set, 4K players cost more than the TV set. Not true anymore. Uh, Redbox, they rent for, uh, 4K Blu-ray titles and they even sell from their, their uh, kiosk boxes, they sell used 4K titles. Amazon sells 4K Blu-ray titles. And some local stores, uh, we have one, near where I live here in Northern Virginia called the CD Seller. It's a re retail, uh, retail store in Falls Church and they buy and sell used 4K titles. So you can go in there and get a 4K title for a lot less you'd spend for the same brand new title. And frankly, you can always take a look at it and see if it's scratched, for instance. Um, they never buy scratched ones in the first place, so they won't sell scratched ones. But that's, you know, their store. Other stores may behave differently. Uh, also streaming. There are 4K opportunities from streaming services. The Roku Premier 4K streaming box was released in 2016, and that's what I bought first when I bought my TV, so I could watch 4K titles on Roku. And they released uh, their uh, Roku Ultra 4K streaming box recently. And the box I bought is still available and now costs only about $25. Uh, Amazon Prime offers some 4K movies to stream, actually a fair number of them. And the same is true on Netflix. Not just movies, TV shows. Some of them are shot in 4K. Uh, if you want to watch a 4K streaming video, you have to keep in mind, if you only have about 10 or 20 megabits per second of download uh, speed into your home on your internet service, you're probably gonna have to get an upgrade of that. Uh, now, the bad news, full high def video cameras are available inexpensively, but that's just full high def, it's not 4K. I've owned, I've owned a couple of them for several years. In fact, I have one of them uh, in use right now as my uh, webcam connected to my computer while I'm speaking to you. Some models of major brands of full high def camcorders sell for a little as $200 and they have good zoom lenses, which makes these work very well as webcams for situations where you are far away from the subject, such as a school performance on stage or a graduation or a wedding. Now, all of these record on flash memory cards these days, mostly uh, secure digital SD cards. Most smartphones and tablet camera apps also record full high def video. But some did, and some digital SD, uh, SLRs also record full high def video for limited time frames. Well, uh, the Canon SLRs that I have, if you 
put it in video mode and start recording, then it automatically stops after half an hour. I don't know the justification for that, but that is the case. Um, the most widely used file format for digital video is MP4, designed by the Motion Pictures Export uh, Expert Group. That's what MP is sort of an abbreviation for, and MPEG also. Um, now, 4K resolution camcorders. Here's where the real bad news is. Okay. Um, it's an old phrase. You've heard it many times. When buying a 4K camcorder, you get what you pay for. And this is what I mean. Amazon is now a wash and has been for a few years. In 4K camcorders priced less than $100. They are from brands even I, who have been photographing for since I was 10 years old. Brands that I've never even heard of and they don't have zoom lenses. They're really aimed for, oh, tweens and teens who want to shoot some video and want to do it at high resolution, but um, I have no reason to believe these things will last very long at those prices. And I certainly believe that a, cam a 4K camcorder without a zoom lens is not worth spending any money on. Now, the major camcorder brands, Canon, for instance, they offer 4K camcorders with zoom lenses, but they cost more than a thousand dollars. It's not now. When frankly, when I have bought a smartphone for that much money, I don't have any left in my retiree budget for buying a 4K camcorder. So I've yet to do that. Now there are some that are available, and they usually come in as used. Um, uh, major brand uh, 4K camera quarters uh, around $800 to $900. Still pretty pricey. And in general, that sort of pricing gap between $100 and $1,000 has persisted to this day, which honestly surprises me. Um, this is why I started looking at 4K live video applications that run on my phone or my tablet, particularly the phones, because nowadays the high-end phones from uh, for Apple and Android uh, have multiple cameras built in at different uh, focal lengths. So you don't have a true zoom lens capability for the most part, but it, it's at least possible that you can shoot with more than one lens and achieve different magnifications. Um, now, if you have a camera, uh, if you have a smartphone that was released, say, four or five years ago, or maybe one that isn't top of the line, uh, take a look at this web page. It gives a list of smartphone models that are known to be compatible with 4K. They can shoot 4K. Now, here's a QR code for that particular web page address. So this is one of those slides that you might want to save now and scan later. Again, I put the hints at the bottom of the screen so that you, if you're using your computer, you can save this slide immediately. Um, one of the things I don't like about that page is it doesn't define what compatibility means. It certainly has to do with the resolution of the camera, the digital camera in the smartphone. But there are other things to be considered as well. And my guess is that they are actually, uh, each person who contributes to that list has actually tested recording with the phone device. Uh, you're gonna need a, a, a camera with the appropriate horizontal and vertical resolution. You're gonna need appropriate pre, uh, CPU speed, RAM speed, and storage speed. Storage speed is important because if you shoot frame number two in 4K and frame number one hasn't been stored yet, well, that's a problem. Um, now, as you might guess, based on what, said, what I just said, 4K resolution in a camera uh, sensor on in your phone is not the only issue. Um, 
I have uh, just purchased a uh, Samsung Galaxy Model 20 FE, and it has three lenses on the back. My old Galaxy S10, I think, also had three. And of course, uh, each has a camera sensor behind the lens, but the camera sensors are usually not all the same resolution. And some, but not all, have 8.3 megapixels and, and can shoot, at least in, in theory, uh, 4K uh, video. Now, uh, to be, uh, since the, uh, the aspect ratio, the ratio of those horizontal and vertical resolutions is 4K, uh, uh, or is 16, point, is 16 to 9 in 4K and in full high def, the sensor horizontal resolution for 4K must equal or exceed 30,840 pixels, and the vertical resolution must equal or exceed 2,160 pixels. Now, frankly, if you go and check that web page that I showed you, it'll tell you whether or not the thing is gonna work with your particular smartphone. So you don't have to worry about figuring out the pixel dimensions of each camera in your, uh, your particular smartphone. Um, but one of the things that's interesting about this is that most camera sensors in smartphones have a, an aspect ratio of about four to three, which is pretty nearly square. So the Galaxy S10, oddly enough, did have one camera sensor that was almost precisely 16 to nine. I thought that was really interesting, which meant it could shoot, um, I mean, if it also had the, the horizontal and uh, vertical resolution requirements, it would be uh, ideal for shooting uh, uh, 4K video. Um, so, um, it turns out the iPhone 6S and more recent iPhones have a point and shoot 4K recording ca capability built into their camera apps. You don't even have to add a different app in order to shoot 4K. There may be advantages in, 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 in terms of using an app that you install as opposed to using the camera app. And we're gonna talk about that. Um, now, in those iPhones, uh, if you want to shoot 4K video uh, with your uh, particular iPhone, you go to the settings app and in settings, you go to camera and then you go to record video. And then on that screen, you select the 4K resolution and frame rate. So that's how you get it set. So when you, you, know, you switch it to video mode, when you're running the camera app, it will record 4K video. That's how you do it. You set it up that way. Then you, once you've done that, you exit the camera app, you go over to, or you exit the settings app, you go over to your camera app, hit the video, and you're going to be recording 4K. The video file type that's produced by that is called Move. Uh, it was originally created for the QuickTime application. Uh, it is lossy, like MP4. It discards information that the developers think your eye is never going to see. Uh, there are people who can argue with that. Um, now here's a, um, a, a screenshot I took on my iPhone 10 when I had it configured to shoot 4K video. And this was just before I hit the record button. So it gives you an idea of what your screen looks like. Uh, and um, what I found in this camera app is that it wasn't a great deal of opportunity to control the exposure requirements, the light balance requirements. So it just made those decisions automatically. And since I come from an era of film photography, when I had to set everything, it was fully manual for both focus and exposure control. Uh, that, that experience with the camera app on my iPhone 10 wasn't ideal. Um, all right, now I have to turn off 
the floating meeting controls again. Every time somebody comes in late, it, it pops up that floating meeting, the meeting controls become permanent instead of uh, hiding them. Okay, various apps then came along to provide improvements on what the default camera app does. And I'm gonna show you a couple of them. All right, I have to go back and click on this. There's one I like called Pro Movie, and here's its icon. Uh, it is a free app. Uh, now you see that you uh, the QR code that will, uh, uh, if you scan it, it will send your iPhone directly to the page in the App Store for Pro Movie. And then you can decide whether or not you want to download it to your phone. So again, save now, scan later. I provided those reminders at the bottom of the page. Uh, this app does provide controls like a digital single lens reflex camera. And in, in other words, something with someone with my level of experience would like to have. And it does record 4K video in move files, just like the camera app itself. And here's its screen, and you're seeing a lot of things here. Um, in particular, you can adjust the shutter, you can adjust the, uh, the sensitivity known as ISO. Um, and there's uh, something else you'll notice, it's a watermark. What they're showing you is the price for obtaining a license to use this thing. I don't know if what extra features come along with that license, but I will tell you this. When you hit the record button, that watermark goes away instantly. So it doesn't get in your way if you're trying to follow some action using your 4K recording capability with this app. Also like the camera app, it had a runtime display. You can see that in the upper left. You can even see me in the reflection of the window. <laughs> um, okay, now the S20. Um, let me see, I bet you I've got, yeah, right, one, one bullet point at a time. Let's do it that way. Um, with your compatible Android phone, uh, you probably need a 4K recording app. Uh, it wasn't until the S20 that I think they were included that in, I know they didn't include it in the F10, S10, and the next model year was the S20. The S20 has it in the camera app, the S10 did not. So I went and looked for an app to use on my S10. And here were the requirements I sort of created for myself. No ads or minimal ads. Uh, high ratings on uh, the Google Play Store. Uh, can be configured to store video on an SD card instead of in the main uh, flash memory of the phone. And hopefully some exposure and focus control. Uh, and ideally it would use all cameras that are compatible with 4K in the phone. That's the one I have never found. Um, I just mentioned this, that as of the Galaxy S20, they included a 4K recording capability in the camera app for its flag for their flagship uh, Samsung Galaxy phones. And as it turns out, in the latest one, in the 22, for the versions with the largest resolution cameras, they include an 8K recording app or recording capability in the camera app. Now here's one that I tried uh, at the beginning of this year um, with my S10, HD camera for Android. There's this icon and here's the QR code for obtaining it from the Google Play Store. Again, something that you might wanna save for use later using the keystrokes that I summarized at the bottom of the screen. Um, its icon name is camera. The name in the store is HD camera for Android. Once you install it, the icon is called camera. Uh, it does not record 4K video by default, but it can be configured to do so. And it records videos into MP4 files. 
and it only uses one of the three compatible cameras on the back of the Galaxy S10. Uh, it'll tell you it uses four cameras, but what it does, it has a switch between camera one, two, three, and four, um, and two of them are the front camera, and the other two are the one back camera that it has decided to use. I don't know why that decision was made. Here's what it looks like when I'm running it on my Galaxy S10. It'll display 4K um, and it'll, uh, there's a, a slider uh, uh, just to the left of the word video in this image. There's a slider that lets you increase or decrease the uh, exposure. Increase means to make brighter, decrease means to make dimmer. So if I really wanted to shoot the outside, I would make this dimmer because the outside is far brighter than my kitchen. Uh, here's another one I tried. It's uh, in the uh, Google Play Store, it's called 4K Camera HD. And it, like the first one I showed you, is free. And it does include exposure controls that are operable during recording. Uh, here's the QR code for it in the Google Play Store. Again, a slide that you might want to save for scanning later. Uh, its name also changed once I installed it. Its, its name on the phone is Open Camera. Uh, like the first one, it uses only one S10 rear camera and it records videos into MP4 files. Both of these could be configured to store on an SD card rather than on in the camera's main flash memory. And here's a hey, copy. John. Uh, yes, sir. John, I need to uh, interrupt for a second before we get too far. I'm sitting here holding my Galaxy 20 waiting to see how to turn on 4K video. And I think we skipped that slide. Yeah, you're right. To you're, go back. you're right. I, that was my mistake. I'm going to go right back to it. Let's do that. Thank you. Okay. With the Galaxy S10, do not tap the record button. The, the default aspect ratio is shown as three to four when you hold the camera vertically. Now, there's a gear icon at the top of the screen. You tap that icon for settings and it will allow you, uh, oh, excuse me, you tap the three to four icon itself and that will allow you to choose other aspect ratio settings, choose nine to 16. Okay. Now, why doesn't it say 16 to nine? It's because you're holding the camera vertically. Um, the default camera app resolution and frame rate will show up as FDH30, and you'll see other choices, including UHD30 and UHD60. You, you get there by tapping the FDH30 icon at the top of the screen. And then when you tap that, you'll see these other choices. UHD30 shoots at 30 frames per second, and as you might guess, UHD 60 shoots at 60 frames per second. You can choose either one. I will warn you when you're working with this, the first thing to do, the first thing I recommend is working at the lower frame rate because these files get big in a hurry and UHD 60 gets big twice as fast as UHD 30. You don't do that unless you know you have the space to make your recording because these get to be big files. Now, John, does that work for you? I got the uh, uh, nine by 16, 16 by nine. Yeah. But the the FHD and 30, I I'm, don't see that one. You don't see that one. Interesting. Okay. Wait Let a second. Me, I, I see it. I got okay. it. Okay. Good, good. I got to admit, these icons are small. It, it's sometimes, uh, depending on how poor your eyesight is, it might not be easy to spot. Um, but as it happens, my uh, my Galaxy S20, is, it's new to me. I've only had it about three weeks, but it's sitting right here. So if, if it's uh, really a mystery, I can go actually work through the steps myself. Now, it, right. it slipped from uh, 
video back or photo video back to photo and I had to go back uh, to video. Yeah, you have to be in video mode in order to manipulate these things. Thank you. That's an important point. Okay. Um, all right, I'll go back to where I was. Just hit the page down fast. Okay, now, um, let's talk about the Motion Picture Experts Group and their version four of their video standard is called MP4. Uh, as I said, it's lossy. What they do basically is discard corners. They blur corners, sharp corners in an image slightly uh, because it's variable that degree of compression although all 4k resolution video files will grow quickly some of them not as rapidly at rapidly as others because they're applying a higher degree of compression and what we're going to do in a moment is compare what each of the uh, different apps do in terms of the number of megabytes of file size per second. It's very interesting because it is distinctly different from one to the next. But the apps don't give you the ability to control the degree of compression, to set it for the right combination of detail and file size for your needs. They don't do that. So the only way you can control it is by getting a different app. I also recommend for Android, if you do have the option to install a micro SD card, do that. The cards that are 120 uh, gigabytes of size are now fairly inexpensive. And I'm not saying you're going to fill that with video. I, half of mine is filled with music. But uh, nonetheless, you get one that you can afford, and it will give you a uh, much greater uh, storage capability than the flash memory that's built into your phone. Um, unfortunately, the most recent two Samsung Galaxy flagship phones, the S21 and the S22, have eliminated the micro SD card slot, which is why I bought a Galaxy S20. Um, now, also, I just alluded to this the file size per second varies because the MP4 standard allows differing degrees of video file compression and each app chose a setting. And we're gonna look at what those consequences are. Okay, here's the tail, table that does the file size comparison. Uh, the uh, 4K camera HD, which is known as open camera on the phone, records at six megabytes per second of 4K video and it records in an MP4 file. Uh, none of these, as I mentioned before, none of these apps allow you to change the degree of loss and therefore change the data storage rate in terms of megabytes per second in the app. What you have to do if you want to change it is get a different app. Now here's the other one that I tried on my S10, the HD camera for Android, which is simply known as camera after I installed it on my phone. And that reduced it by a little bit over 10%, which is not bad. Uh, on my iPhone X, the default camera app itself records about 6.15 megabytes per second. And they store it in a move file, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the alternative I tried really made a difference. It reduced it by more than one third 3.9 megabytes per second pro movie. And that's especially significant on iPhone because you don't have a lot of other places to store other than on the phone itself. If you can uh, redirect it to restore it on iCloud, for instance, I haven't tried it, but that might be a real opportunity right there to minimize the impact on your, your phone because you can't otherwise expand the storage, except you can. And that's by using something that uh, a flash memory device that plugs directly into 
the charging slot on your iPhone. That may allow you to res restore, uh, to store your, your video file on that device. Um, and on the S20, uh, using the default camera app and UHD 30, uh, it was seven megabytes per second. And boy, am I glad I have a card slot. Um, all right, I just gave away this slide. One of the things you can do is buy a small flash device that plugs into your charging slot on your phone. Um, and those are available actually at not outrageously bad prices on uh, Amazon. And one of another thing that might be an issue, not just how much storage you're going to use up, is how much battery power you're going to lose up. Here's one of those devices on Amazon that's designed for a charging uh, socket connection. This is one by SanDisk, and it has a lightning plug on one end, and although it's covered, it has a USB-C socket or plug on the other end. So this can plug in both to my uh, iPhone 10, and it can also plug into my Galaxy S20 or S10, both of which use USB-C socket. Now, if you're worried about consumption of battery power, you can buy an on-the-go cable, also known as OTG, for your phone, and in particular one that's called three-way, because that allows you not only to connect a device like the SanDisk device here to one of the three plugs on the cable, but there is also a plug that goes, connects it to your phone so that the USB storage device is connected to your phone. And a third thing, a socket that allows you to connect power to your phone, such as a power bank battery. If you're shooting on a, what you might call a, a, a travel uh, situation or plug it in directly to a wall charger block. And this is an example of a three-way on the go cable for Apple devices. It has a USB-A socket for connecting an inexpensive flash drive device. It has a lightning socket for connecting power to the iPhone. And uh, you see the cable that connects it, that device with a lightning plug into an iPhone. So uh, that's known as an OTG cable with three-way capability. It's not very expensive. Uh, trying to remember, 25 bucks maybe? And then you can set the 4K, uh, with any luck, you can set the 4K video recording app on the iPhone to connect onto that attached flash drive. These cables, these three-way cables also exist for Android devices. All right. Now let's talk about editing. You shot the video, you put it on your computer. How do you edit it? Uh, but more importantly, why? Why bother? Well, the answer first, if you shot a number of short related files, you might wanna connect them together so that you have one continuous presentation. You might wanna add titles and other superimposed text to tell people you know, something about what's going on, where you shot it, for instance. I've got a lot of video I shot of my grandson at the uh, two different places that he lived while my son-in-law was still in the army. And I think it'd be a good idea for him to include information about where the video was shot so he can recognize it. Um, a third reason for editing video, which is vitally imp important to those of us who do this on a regular basis, to remove your mistakes such as jiggling the phone or the tablet that you were using to shoot it. Uh, and a tip, buy an inexpensive tripod with a camera holder attached to minimize jiggle. I uh, have, uh, I bought a five, it was about five and a half dollars at Staples, a small six inch tripod with the camera holder attached to it. And that camera holder attaches using the standard tripod quarter inch 
threaded socket. So I can put that on, on any of my other professional type tripods. Um, all right, now, Windows Video Editor Applications. Um, why this is important. I learned over many years of experience that there are some versions of MP4 files that use options that are defined by the Motion Picture Experts Group but are not commonly used in the video files. And the result is that in some cases, the video editor hasn't been programmed to use those options. And so it says, I can't load this file. Um, so it's important to make sure that the video that you've recorded using your phone can be loaded and used in the editor. Um, I didn't hit any glitches when I made these tests that I'm about to describe, uh, but I did test 4K MP4 files from my Galaxy S10 and move files from my iPhone 10. And I tried two different video editors, uh, Vegas Movie Studio 16, which is I think been subject to a name change, and VideoPad, the one from Down Under, uh, version 10.36, uh, which you can download for free. And here's what I tested. First of all, does the file load into the video editor? Does the editor application preview the file, show you frames as you move back and forth in the timeline in the video editor? Does the editor application allow you to cut and paste pieces? And that's what you do when you clean up your mistakes. Uh, I tested this on a Windows computer, which I no longer use because it died. Uh, it was uh, running Windows 10 and it had eight gigabytes of RAM. Now, all recording apps that I tested produced files that were completely compatible with both Vegas Movie Studio 16 and the VideoPad editor. Uh, but I do want to suggest something. Uh, adjust your window page file size so that it equals or exceeds your RAM size when you're attempting to do editing. Do that before you start up your editor for the first time. Uh, also, when you are editing, shut down all other apps on your computer. Uh, you're going to need as much RAM as you can possibly uh, allocate to that editor application. This editing 4K video is a big deal. Typically, the video itself is going to be much bigger than 8 gigabytes. Okay, so I had to do some tests when I got my S20 three weeks ago, and by then the software had changed on my newer computer. I bought a new desktop computer with 16 gigabytes of memory, a new Windows uh, desktop. Uh, I bought the S uh, that I bought about mid-year, and then uh, uh, later I bought the S20 uh, right at the end of November. I tested with my video pad, this time version 10.63, and Magix, which took over publication of the video editors that were originally sold by Sony, Sony under the Vegas name, uh, they have released a version called Magic Movie Studio 2023. So I tested with that. And uh, for the 4K MP4 video file produced by the Galaxy S20, all tests were successful. I could load it, I could see it in the preview window, uh, and I could do cut and paste successfully. So it worked just fine. Now, once you've used your editor and you've produced a product that you're willing to show to somebody, or even if you just want to give it a test, there are a couple of different ways to watch 4K video. One of them, of course, involves a 4K TV. And as it turns out, some recent computers provide 4K video resolution display for a monitor. The one I, the desktop computer I have does that. And as it turns out, I even have a tiny little Raspberry Pi 400 
that uh, that like its older brother, the uh, 4B, has 4K video resolution sockets on it to connect to a monitor. I haven't bought the monitor yet. I'm getting there, but I haven't done it yet. Uh, the computer I have is a PowerSpec G231. I don't think they make it anymore, uh, but it had two HDMI outputs and two DisplayPort outputs all at 4K resolution. The Raspberry Pi, as I mentioned, has two 4K HDMI outputs. Uh, in terms of monitors, both Dell and HP offer 4K resolution computer monitors. In November, the prices were about 260. I've also seen one from L, uh, from Samsung that was advertised for uh, $230 earlier this month. So it, it pays to shop around and, and look at the prices if that's what you want. And of course, you won't want the monitor unless your computer provides that resolution. Um, now we're going to talk about playing video 4K video files on an LG television a 4K HD TV. Uh, it turns out it is smart enough to, the TV is smart enough to play both MP4 and move files. What I did was put those files on a flash drive that I could plug into the USB socket on the HD TV. And once I did that, then I turned on the TV and I found on, in the menu of all inputs, the input selection menu, uh, which came up on a TV when I pushed the input button on the remote control. Uh, it displayed this menu, which I circled for you, and they include things you, if you have a full HDF TV, you're probably familiar with sockets labeled HDMI 1 and HDMI 2, and maybe more. Um, but on this TV, they also treated the USB flash drive as an input and it's available if you've plugged something into the USB socket. So I circled all that for you to see. It appears on the right side of the TV. And then you can use the remote to move up and down that list of inputs and select the USB flash drive input. Now, once you do that, it takes a look at the USB drive and then says, oh, you have movies and music on this flash drive. Maybe you only have one or the other. Uh, so it shows you a menu with two choices, photo and video or music. So select photo and video. Then it will show you a list of flash drive photos and videos. If you have more of those files than will conveniently appear, it will show you part of them and allow you to scroll up and down through the list. Use the remote to select the video that you want to view. And it'll start playing it on your set. And after that video finishes, the HDTV will play the other videos on the flash drive and, you, and perhaps the photos. You can stop that using the remote. Just hit the stop button. Okay, now, we're just about done. I am going to show you again the QR code for all the things that I mentioned in this presentation. First of all, the Wikipedia page that lists 4K compatible phones. Here it is again. You can save this now and scan it later. Pro Movie for iPhone, one of the 4K recording apps that you can use on perhaps on older phones, but it does even on phones that already allow the camera app itself to shoot 4K video this offers some improvements. So this is another page where I've put the reminders on the bottom so you can save it now and scan it after this presentation is done or later than that if you want. The uh, first one I mentioned for uh, my Galaxy S10, the HD camera for Android. Here's the QR code again so that you can get it from the Play Store and uh, I provided the reminders again at the bottom, so you can scan it now, and then I, I keep stumbling over that. You can save this slide now, and then display it on your screen and scan later. Uh, 
Here's another one of those apps that I tested for Android. Uh, it's on my phone, it's called Open Camera. And I uh, provided the QR code so you can download it from the App Store, the Play Store app on your phone. Uh, this, you, when you scan the QR code, it will offer you the option to open the Play Store to the page for this particular app. All right, again, save now, scan later. Uh, I want to mention the next thing I'm going to be doing. The next original presentation I'm doing will be on Saturday, January 21st. Uh, it'll start at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to deliver a presentation on a brand new topic for my home club, the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society. It's called Bluetooth and Pairing, and it's going to be a very non-technical look at why pairing is so important and how to do it. It's basically three steps. I'll show you the screen captures that allow you to do this both on uh, a Samsung phone and uh, an Android and on an iPhone. Um, when I do this sort of thing, I give you uh, uh, analogies to everyday experiences that we've all had so we can understand each of the three steps that are required to make use with your smartphone of something like a car stereo or earbuds or portable speakers. Uh, if Bluetooth has been an enigma to you, if you don't really understand why it's useful or you don't understand how to use it, then this presentation will enlighten you. If you are a member of an APCUG affiliated user group, then you are invited to attend. And you can do that by Zoom, just like so many of you are doing today. So how do you do that? Well, you need to send an email to this address, ffxmtg at padaces.org. And in that meeting, you include your full name, your city and state, and your user group name. You put all that in the email. I suggest this subject line, request Zoom details for the January 21 meeting. Or you can save this screen, scan the QR code when you later when you learn how to do it. And this particular QR code will write the email for you. You scan this using your phone, it will open your email app and it will fill in the addressee, it'll fill in the subject line, it'll fill in most of the body of the email and give you spaces to include your full name, your user group name, and city and state. So save it now, scan it later. And that's it, we're done. I'm going to kill the uh, uh, screen share and I will uh, be happy to entertain questions. There we go. Okay, a um, information from Die Binder, the paid program company that she uses, imemories.com, for videos, film, and photos, scanning to digital. Uh, they're offering a, an e-gift card. So if this is something you are interested in, you might want to ask your relatives when they say, what would you like for Christmas, mom or dad? And you go, I'm going to have everything. I don't want any other tchotchkes. You might say, hey, I'd like an e-card at iMemories and give it a try without having to pay for it. A comment from Kurt, the reason most many devices record in device storage instead of the SD card is the speed of recording and storing the file. Right. And here's a Linux comment that perhaps uh, the Linux team could flesh out at the December 28 meeting. Uh, Linux screen captures vary. It depends on the Linux distribution, the desktop, and versions. There may or may not be a key combination that will directly save images versus putting on the clipboard. May require multiple steps to save an image in some cases. Over to you. Uh, maybe we could ask Dave to research that for us. Open for questions. We love questions. And the chat box is closed, so you'll need to raise your hand 
to ask a question. That's your digital hand. Kurt. Yeah, um, this past weekend, I was doing some experimenting with a couple of LG TVs and Miracast or, and or um, uh, whatever, app, AirPlay, I believe what, what uh, uh, Apple calls it. One of the LG TVs I was working with allow, had a facility to connect Apple devices as well as Android devices. Uh, but that's one way of taking in and uh, uh, showing what, what yes. you get. And, yeah. and also from Windows, and I presume from Mac, you can wirelessly add a display where the display is your television using the same technology. Yes. The that critical point, Kurt, is whether or not those methods will provide the imaging of your 4K file at 4K resolution on the television. And I do not have a clear answer to that question yet. They do. Again, it depends on a number of things. And um, it's very important to find an alternative method to confirm that what your phone transmits under those circumstances is received as 4K at the receiving end. And that is not always going to be the case. Kurt, uh, any of the LGs that you have been working with or on or whatever, do they have a mouse as part of their controller? Uh, um, the short answer is on mine, yes. Okay, how about you, Kurt? What uh, what do you mean by by a mouse? The, the, the little button where you where you in the square where you say yes, I, that's what I want to do. Uh, LGs have new ones that that also is a mouse. Yeah, both of the LG TVs. These happen to be a church, and they were of different vintages. Both of them were using the same uh, model generic remote control. So okay. I can't answer that question. All righty. Oh, well, I want to. I need I'm a remote control. Extra friend here. What can I tell you? Uh, anyway, over to you, George. So, uh, John, if I go to the store because I have visual acuity problems, right? If I go to the store and I decide that I'm going to buy a TV based on what I see there, is that a good approach to? figuring out whether it'll do me any benefit over 1080p? Well, you could, uh, most of these stores are gonna carry both and you could compare them side by side. Same, same TV size, one at 4K and one at 1080p and see if it makes a difference for your experience. Um, of course, one of the things that I didn't really address is what happens when you watch a full HD, a 1080p video on a 4K set. Well, most most 4K sets will upscale them and fill the screen. Um, so you have to make sure that what you're watching on the 4K set is actually 4K resolution media. Now, from a customer's viewpoint, it might be simple to take 4K resolution media in on a flash drive. My experience. When I was shopping for a set that would display a video on a flash drive on a set, because I was looking for that capability for um, a small set that I was going to, uh, this was back in 2011, I was going to use that small set basically as a digital picture frame. My experience was this, I went to Target and their store policy was we don't let the customer touch that USB drive on any of our display TVs. Yeah, permanent memory. <laughs> well, it, it's not only that, they, you know, somebody in their tech department at the headquarters decided these are Linux. We don't have any sort of virus protection on these Linux boxes, so we're not gonna let anybody put anything in them. I went to Radio Shack. Now they didn't have a great variety of high def TVs uh, on, the, on the display floor 
but they said, oh, that sounds cool. Let's try it. And they tried it on three different TVs and they couldn't get any of them to display the photos. Then I went to Best Buy and the guy said, oh, cool, let's try it. And the first thing we tried it on, it worked fine. And that's the one I brought home. Um, this was pre-smart TV, so it was a, a very dumb TV, but uh, it did have the capability to display things on a flash drive. Um, what I'm telling you is I expect most of the experiences at retail will be um, like the one I ran into at Target. So you, when you're doing the direct comparison for your purpose, you need to make sure that the store can provide 4K something on the 4K TV and can also show the same something on an HD TV, whether that's a Netflix stream or that's a, a output from a Blu-ray player, it doesn't matter, but you have to have a good side-by-side -side comparison to decide if 4K is gonna do you any good. And that means displaying the same stuff on both. Okay, thanks, that's great. What blows my mind is the fact that you went to the Radio Shack. I thought they were all closed. Well, this is 2011. Oh, okay. Never mind. They're uh, closed. No. And, and I might add, there are stores that stayed open. How they did so, I don't know. But I know of at least one in Virginia that is still operating. I've driven by it several times. And I, I know of some in other states that I found on the web. That doesn't mean a whole lot. We have one here that's still open. Really? That's Oklahoma City. That's where uh, Bill is. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Bill Ginsburg, you're on. Hold your space bar down. Unmute yourself. Still can't hear you, Bill. It's easier to just hold your space bar down. Okay. How is that? Great. Okay. Is there any danger in scanning a QR code? Uh, it comes up all over the place. You know, that's a good point. Yes. I have only found, heard from one person who said, I heard that if I scan a QR code on a, a parking meter, that it might direct me to somebody who is a pirate and taking my money without without allowing me to pay for parking. Okay, the only time this has ever come up is in a context where somebody wants to take your money. I have heard of nothing else. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Uh, if it's if it doesn't involve somebody who wants to take your money the chances of causing grief on your portable device is minuscule i i won't say it's zero because look we all know bad apples can be creative and maybe somebody will figure out some other way but when you scan the first thing that happens on your smartphone is that the camera app will say do you want to go here and if it looks bananas just ignore it hit the back button and that ends the risk it's not going to actually do what the qr code wants it to do unless you say yes up front but you really that's a little spooky you don't it's hard to recognize just what the qr code is doing I will include an FBI article about beware of scanning QR codes to the follow-up material. I'd like can to I see add it something, Judy. Can I add something, please? Sure. I think sure. the most important thing is know your uh, your vendor, who you're dealing with. It's like if you're at a restaurant and the menu is uh, presented to you as a QR code, um, I would say that would be safe. I would ask the waiter, but I think you'll be okay there. I mean, you just don't randomly go scanning QR codes just uh, on a whim. You, it's just like the one that uh, Kurt, I mean, uh, that uh, uh, John has provided us today. I used the one to register for the um, workshop. 
and it worked perfectly. But I know John, so I was perfectly felt perfectly comfortable with scanning the QR code. Yeah. You know, it's just a matter of using your your intuition. If you think it's safe, use it. If not, don't do it. This is Otherwise, this is one of the reasons. Only... This is one of the reasons why the the example of the parking meter is so troubling, because you as an individual when you approach a parking meter maybe it's provided by the city maybe it's provided in a par private parking garage you don't know who is supposed to be collecting your money and therefore looking at the web page the web page that's mentioned in your in your camera app when you look at it you have no idea if that's the right place to go or some pirate and how do you find that out well you have to talk to your your the government in the local jurisdiction for a public parking meter because they may be directing it to a, a you know commercial vendor or you have to look at what whatever information is available in the park private parking garage and most of these entities that i just mentioned they've never thought this through so they don't provide the information in big, bold letters. It's a tough nut to crack, but again, it's only in places where somebody expects to take your money immediately because that's where the risk is greatest. Even in a, even in a restaurant, and I've been to a restaurant that, you know, you access the menu through uh, QR code because they don't want to pay for menus that they have to update every three months. Um, even there, you can get it on the screen and then ask. You don't have to ask the waiter first. You can ask them afterwards on the screen. Is this the real deal? Is this what I should be looking at? Because uh, the waiters know. They do it all the time. Um, so uh, I, I just want to say, I honestly think outside of parking meters, the real, the real reason that parking meters are hacked as much as they are is simply that it's easy to put a sticker on it that covers the official QR code and people expect to pay their money immediately. It's a very quick transaction. That doesn't exist in any other context that I can think of. For okay, most if I am uh, nervous about something, my plan is to use non-sequential $20 bills, which I only handle with rubber gloves. <laughs> a bill, in my opinion, is the same thing as don't click on links, uh, links that you don't know where it's going to go in your email that somebody yeah. sends you. Yeah. Don't click on something strange in your Facebook account. QR codes are the new kids on the block that everybody is starting to use. They're extremely hackable and it's buyer beware. If I will comment that somebody gave me like a that, URL. You have to trust them that their, their packages that have the QR codes are done by Walmart or Sam's Club or whoever, and those are good to go. Somebody else, you haven't got a clue. Thomas, you're on. In Europe, taxes were significantly higher on movie cameras than on still cameras. And the definition of a movie camera was a camera that could make a film, a movie of more than uh, about 29.95 seconds. So many, most digital single lens reflex cameras could not make a continuous uh, video recording that would hit 30 minutes. Uh, that's probably the same for uh, uh, smartphones. Uh, Nikon's Z9 mirrorless camera can go to about two hours or two and a half hours, depending on the size of your uh, memory card. Uh, yeah. There's a heating problem, you know, on any kind of recording device if you go too far. Yeah. And yeah. his comment, our question from the chat box was, do these movie camera apps all support audio too? Yes. Oh, definitely. I mean, come on. They wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to. Nobody would use these things if they don't record audio. They do. Okay. Now, it, there's audio, and then there's audio. 
what I mean by that is you can record it with the microphone built into, for instance, my full HD camera has a microphone built into it. It's about the same quality as a microphone on a smartphone, which is to say it's engineered for voice grade audio. Now, if you want to shoot a movie that other people will be delighted to sit through and has good quality audio, you attach external microphones, which you can do on a, a an FHG camcorder like what I have, but you can also do it on your smartphone and get much better audio. Um, many people in the business will tell you that for most purposes, the audio quality is more important than the video quality. So I use a couple of $100 microphones attached, so I have stereo going into my full HD camcorder, and I can also attach them to my, uh, my smartphones. And as it turns out, um, as an extra advantage when you're doing a presentation, if one fails, you still get audio from me. So it's a backup. It's not just a matter of audio quality, it's a matter of having a backup capability when something fails. Cool. Over to you, Kurt. Yeah, a, cu a couple of comments. Uh, I happened to take a newbie to a micro center a couple of days ago. And as we were tour touring through areas that I don't normally go, we took a look at some, uh, a lot of monitors and the, the large monitors and the, the displays were simply fantastic. Yep. It was very, very, very impressed by yep. the quality, 4K and maybe a little bit higher. Uh, some of them are wider, so they'll they'll have the vertical resolution will be 4K and the and and you know they're extra wide, so effectively you get a multi monitor capability in one monitor. Yep. And, um, uh, regarding QR codes, okay, I'm going to echo what other people have said. Only scan them if you know 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 that they come from reliable sources because it's really easy to take and direct you to some nefarious site and a QR code, okay? Uh, Particularly in a public context, that's the key. Because yes. in a public context, somebody can cover up a legit QR code with a sticker they've made up. Yes. Or a, put one in some place that might not normally have one, okay? Yes. But a serious question. Are you aware of an application that can take and read a QR code from within an image? Yes. I'm aware of a couple of them. Um, tell me. <laughs> there's, uh, uh, and, and, this, and it particularly is valuable when you have watched a presentation that talks about an editor that runs on your computer. There's no point in scanning it with your smartphone because the application will run on your smartphone. So there are the, uh, the one that is available from the Windows application store is called Free QR Code Scanner. There's actually more than one, but that one's free and it does a good job. It'll scan those screen captures that you may have done today, identify the QR code within it and scan it. It's very good at that. I have tested it quite a bit because I wanted to add that to my presentation on QR codes. Okay. Have you, uh, uh, will it also uh, identify multiple QR codes? That I have not tried. I don't know the answer. Um, I would, I, I, I think that's an interesting test that ought to be done and I'll give that a try. Thank you for suggesting that. Uh, there isn't one for, uh, for Macintosh users called QR Journal. I, I don't have a Mac, I haven't tested it, but I did research it. It is free and it does the same thing. You have a screen capture on your screen or screen capture on your, in a folder, you can open it with QR Journal and it will scan the QR code within that screen capture file. Uh, John Kraut, could you put both of those in the uh, chat box for me? Uh, and John, okay. John, the other John will turn it back on for you. Bill James, over to you. Unmute yourself, please.
I should have uh, lowered my hand. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay, Bill. I, I always enjoy hearing from you. Uh, any other questions? If, if there be none, over to John Kennedy, who will walk us off. There, now I can talk. My question was going to be, we've got just a second, I got to see if I can find somebody's real staticky. Would would be if you go to a, a parking lot, like my son and his boys went to a ball game, and the lot was one that you paid for ahead of time, so you had a spot reserved somewhere in the building. But if you go to something like this, which doesn't usually have an attendant, and you've got to use the QR code, you know. What are you supposed to do if you okay. aren't quite sure? The answer that I know from personal experience, there's a show that comes to uh, the, uh, the Washington Nationals Stadium every year in December called Enchant Christmas. It's very expensive to attend, and they charge money for parking. When I pay for parking through their website, they send me a QR code. When I get up to the turnstile that lets my car into the lot, I hold the QR code on my phone up to the turnstile and it scans the QR code I have. That's how I get in. I don't know if that's the same case that your your boy experienced, but to me, that's a very secure mechanism. I don't yeah, worry about, way. yeah. Uh, now, on the other hand, I did at the University of Virginia, this, uh, this year, I went and uh, now that was, I take it back, that was a couple of years ago. Uh, I had to pay for parking in a university lot. There was no attendant and they said, use thus and such an app. And if you don't have it, here's the QR code for downloading the app. Well, in fact, that QR code did download the app and I was able to pay for parking. That doesn't mean somebody wouldn't cover up that QR code with the pirate sticker. Um, but in my case, you know, my phone told me it was going to uh, show me that app in the Google Play Store. So I was reasonably confident that I had a good QR code to work with there. And John, I would venture to say that, you know, if you did get scammed by um, one of those sites and um, I don't believe you would be liable for any charges, you know, that occurred from yeah, that. Yeah, th this, is, this is an important point. Okay, this is why we use credit cards, or at least one of the reasons. Credit cards have learned that there are bad apples out there that somehow manage to, you know, swindle you into paying them some money. And they have pretty strong protection for you as their customer. You tell them about it. And they will um, remove the charges from your bill. Now, having said that, I ran into one uh, where I was, I was in Southern Virginia, very rural area. And my credit card company called me and said there were some questionable charges. And I, I said, I'll call you back. I went and looked at my computer, reviewed the charges. I found they went back four years. Wow. And at the time, the agent I was working with, the, the agent from the credit card company, said their standard policy was to refund the last six months, which they did within four days. I got a check to, uh, this year saying, you were misinformed. Here's the money for all of the four years. It was over $2,900. Wow. And I got to admit, those folks, it took them some time, but they did the quality check on their service and realized they owed me a lot of money and they made me good. Okay. So you have, your credit card company can help you a lot in these circumstances. Just keep well, them talking, keep you know, to make it easier on them. If you think you've been scammed at a minimum, Record the date and time 
so that it can be found on your credit card statement and corrected. And and report it. I mean, if you yeah, feel that right. it's uh, call that them something's happened, call them yeah. and tell them. Exactly. Call them immediately. Don't wait. On that positive note, oh, Bill? Comment. Uh, some years ago, I got a telephone slam on a MasterCard, and they said, okay, we'll send you a, a letter, sign it, and it'll be end. I signed the letter and mailed it the same day. Next month, the charge appeared again. I called them up. They said, we'll send you a fax. I sent the fax back on the same day. Same thing happened. This went on for five or six months. And that was on MasterCard. And this was many years ago. Then I had something that happened on my American Express card. One letter, one phone call, that was it. I think American Express has better customer service. Which, which card were you talking about, by the way? Uh, this was a USAA visa. Now, mind you, it's not visa that you talk to. It's the people who issue you the card. And in my case, that was USAA. Um, I have American Express. They have been very good at dealing with me over the phone. I've never had to write a, only had one issue uh, there of uh, a, uh, a charge that wasn't valid, and they issued me a new card immediately. Um, I think American Express is great. I think USAA is to be commended, although, you know, I could have used it. 2,900 bucks the day that we identified the uh, transactions. But um, they did get me the money. Uh, and uh, the third one I use is uh, Citibank. I've been with them for more than 20 years, and they have been great also whenever I've hit a snag like this. Um, I'm, let's see here. There's one other thing I wanted to mention. I, I did a presentation on Sunday for a group called the Southeast Mid Michigan Computer Organization. And one of them mentioned a URL, which could be used that would make your life easier for part of what I was talking about. And I agreed with him. I tried it on the spot and it worked. I decided to add it to that presentation for future use. And I went and after I put it into my presentation, I went and clicked on the URL just to make sure that I had, you know, added it properly so that it would work for anybody who got the PDF of the slide deck. And it opened up the website and I must have clicked on one of the ads on that website by mistake. I got the most startling uh, webpage display I've ever seen. Your computer has been locked. Um, do not attempt to open anything. Call this phone number so our tech team can help you resolve this issue. Folks, it was a scam. Of course. And it was one of those, it was the most unnerving, you know, attempt to steal my money that I have ever seen. It Now, what did I do? The first thing I did was try to close that tab in my browser. And it closed nice and clean. There wasn't anything locked. Don't trust every adverse notice that comes your way. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for this year. We have one more workshop in two weeks because of the holiday. Linux will be back on the fourth Wednesday instead of the third. We really want to thank you for supporting us this past year, and we look forward to providing you more workshops in the coming year. We need more ideas, and we need more presenters. So thank you so much. Have a great holiday season with all the different holidays you may be celebrating. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the new year. I want to mention, for those of you who have not seen one of my presentations before, this presentation does include QR codes. Uh, there's a very good reason for that. The QR codes provide a, pick, a quick way to access a web page. I mean, for you to access the web page or PDF document or phone or tablet app that you can install, an email you can send, other valuable info. Um, now, you may not yet know how to scan a QR code. I'm going to give you uh, 
an APCUG presentation that is on YouTube that you can uh, view to learn that technique. And uh, one of the values of a QR code is that when you scan instead of typing, then you don't incur typos. And we all know that it's very frustrating to uh, type in a long URL and find that we've not correctly keyed it. And so we have to figure out where the mistake is. QR codes eliminate that as long as the person, i.e. me, who's creating them, does it right. Um, and it turns out if you have a recent Android operating system or recent iOS operating system in your phone, then you can scan with the camera app in your phone. That's a very handy way to do it. Don't even need to tap the shutter button. All right, having said all that, I realize a lot of you don't know how to scan, and I'm gonna show you something that'll make it possible for you to take advantage of the QR codes I show you today anyway. A um, Couple months ago, I came across this idea called Save Now, Scan Later. And what it means is, that you can use a keystroke combination on your computer to save any slide you want in a presentation. And that might be a slide containing a QR code. When you use the keystroke combo, it gets the image stored as a screen capture file on your computer. It happens a lot faster than you can unlock your phone to scan the QR code immediately. And it's stored in a known place so that you can find it whenever you need it. And after that presentation, then at your leisure, you can display the screen image file and scan the QR code. Now we can extend that idea a little bit further. You can save now and then learn to scan later. And the idea is that even if you don't know what a QR code is, well, you'll learn that today, but you'll be able to save it today learn to scan it later, and then display what you saved and scan it. So here's the YouTube video about learning how to scan a QR code. This presentation I did quite a while back for APCUG. And on top of it, here are the keystrokes you need to save a slide from this presentation on your computer. So. In Windows, it's the Windows key plus the print screen key. You hold down the Windows key, and while that's held down, tap print screen. And where does it store? It stores in a subfolder of your pictures folder called screenshots. Nice descriptive name. In the Mac, you hold down two keys, the command key and the shift key, and then you tap the number five key. Where does it save? It saves in the desktop folder which is very easy to find. And for Linux, it's just the print screen key itself. And then in your home account, whatever, whatever your account name is under home, that's where the file is stored. All right, and I'll show you this uh, YouTube video URL again. You can save it immediately with the keystrokes I just showed you, and by the way, those keystrokes are shown again here as a reminder at the bottom of the screen. So if you need that, save it now, go ahead and read it later, visit the YouTube video, and by the way, it's uh, the part that actually teaches you how to use your phone to scan a QR code is just a hair over 18 minutes long. It's time well spent.